This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today, he brought a big bowl of curry. It is Jacob A. Miller, the cinematologist, not Hans. Hans is not with us this evening. He didn't want to watch another M. Night film. How unfortunate. Jake, how are you doing? Great, great. What a shame on Hans. Uh, apparently, he didn't have a good time going to his uh, local Indian restaurant, so he's holding this against M. Night. I, would, I wouldn't blame him one bit. You know, he's got a very sensitive colon, that Hans. I don't know if you've heard this. I don't know if you've experienced this. I don't know if you've smelt this before. But Hans's colon is notorious, of course. Well, it's funny you say that because actually that brings back the memory. It's almost three years later after we uh, finished the last leg of like principal photography on Mass State Lottery. And I can still smell those farts, man. And that small apartment in Everett, certainly the one in Quincy on the first leg. I, I think that place is probably condemned since then, but it was not just Hans. It was definitely all four of us, but. But it was mostly Hans and he blamed you for, you know, he blamed you for breaking the toilet seat. He said, Jake's big ass broke the toilet seat. I, I do said, have a big ass. But. <laughs> this is this is news to me. I don't know. We never solved that mystery of who cracked the toilet seat that that one fateful morning. That should be the sequel. To <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be the sequel to Mass Day Lottery. <laughs> It'll be very Wes Craven's new nightmare because we'll all be playing ourselves as the characters and then solving a new mystery. I think it'll work fantastic. But uh, you know who is kind of the modern master of mysteries m night Sh that's what the m stands for is mystery m night Shyamalan, who it's not even a new film at this point it's been out for a while but i saw that you watched it kind of recently How, why did it take you so long well i've been doing a lot of movie marathons on my days off from work because this is my shameless plug amc a list uh is a gift from the gods so on my days off i'll go to the uh go to the amc up here we're down here in dallas and I'll rack up like three movies a day when I go. And uh, so Trap has been on my radar. I've been so pumped for it since I first saw the trailer, but uh, just things kept coming up like uh, shoots on other projects and then extra days at work. So it's just been a process to finally get to the theater. But a few days ago, I did. I, I did that in a marathon where uh, I saw this last after I saw Strange Animals or not. not uh, no, Strange, Strange Darling. Darling. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw Blink twice from Zoe Kravitz, and then I saw this one last. So I had a good good sandwich of uh, mystery and thriller films. So. Yeah, I you I knew something was up with your movie viewing, and that you must have had a pass where you were marathoning it because I, I I check up on your letterbox, and I saw Blink twice, but I also saw Dee Dee, and I was like, in what world is he going to the movies to see Dee Dee? This is this is very out of left field. I, I had a friend that really loved it, and, and the, the trailer did look pretty cool, and I thought the uh, sort of nostalgic appeal to it was was kind of cool, because you and I really came up in that time, and it, it, that one, a short review, it mostly does the job, but then at some point you realize, oh, he just, this like 29-year-old director, just he, he made an autobiography, and he sprinkled a little bit of fiction in it, so it it's a little self-serving, and uh, the whole... 2008 online kind of atmosphere to it isn't really explored as much as it promised so hmm. it, it's kind of a gimmick for this guy to tell his own autobiography so you and i should make our own autobiography films and just you know instead of uh the the main character's name being jay you just name him uh, gray or something like that. yes great that's a very common name is gray <laughs> I've heard That's that. Good. Not Ray, yeah, but... not uh, not not Faye, but we'll go with the color gray. Yeah. So. Well, it's enigmatic too. So. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, Dee, I, I heard good things about it. I heard it was very MySpace era, which that appeals to me certainly. But if that is not really explored as much as one would hope, and I didn't know the director was twenty nine years old. That makes me dislike him in that movie a little bit because you only wind up with a movie that goes to theaters and you're 29 years old if you're sucking some old guy's dick probably you're you're doing something that has nothing to do with your talent or your skill and someone gave you a big opening as a result of that and i don't you know they haven't been kind or as kind i should say 
to the Asian American filmmakers in 2024 compared to say 2020, where it was just like, yeah, we're going to put every single Asian American movie on HBO max and put that on the front page. And, uh, Hey, spoiler alert for anyone who wants to watch an Asian American movie. They all fucking suck. Every single one of them <laughs> fucking sucks. And um, you have authority on that too. You're, you're apparently a sworn in member of the tribe. So yes, I was, I was, uh, inducted many, many a year ago. So is it uh, like a Masonic temple thing where they like knight you? on the on the shoulders but instead yes. of a, instead of a sword they just use chopsticks mm. it's exactly like that what is it i have a i have a masonic temple nearby what is that group what is that group that the anyone what is it the, the freemasons the freemasons that, yeah, yeah that's who i'm thinking of yeah it's a lot like the freemasons where you can show up you know you don't have to do much you just pay a fee and you can show up in like gym shorts you know, which is like the only organization where you can do that. So, but yeah, that's like Asian people. Anyway, speaking of Asian, so, yes, yeah, the I'm other like kind of Asian. Yeah. Suddenly now we consider Indian Asian. When I was a kid, we, we did not. I mean, it's part of Asia. We all know it's part of Asia, but what else is part of Asia? Russia? Are they Asian? No. But we're talking about M. Night and we've done a series a little bit on M night. We, we talked about his earlier films. We covered the sixth sense signs unbreakable. And I feel like we did one more. Did we, we I don't think we the village, the, maybe, maybe we got the village. I, it could have been the village. I feel like we were planning to talk about old, but that conversation got wrapped into another episode, maybe, or maybe we did do my old. I don't know. I don't we know. We can kind of do a rundown because it, it's been a while since, for one, since I've been on the show, but two, since we've had that conversation. So we can do a short preface if you want. Sure. I mean, well, I would like, here's what I've been doing recently. I've been doing this little workaround if you, I need to take a week off from recording, which at the moment I don't because we've been doing these listener sponsored episodes where people pay a hundred bucks and we got a complete rush of them and have to make the show now twice a week as a result of that for people wanting us to watch really horrible stuff like Laquisha or The Pest or all these mostly good, but sometimes really painful to sit through movies. And it's been a second since um, we did M Night. But what I was saying before was I've been packaging the episodes that all have a common theme together. So this will probably wind up in that I'll have to put out all the M Night episodes is one big like nine hour episode at some point and we were intended to continue doing that but then i think maybe we just got tuckered out with the village or something we hit some kind of roadblock and then maybe we did texas chainsaw one and two instead i can't i can't remember really it's been a while but we wound up going off that course and getting into something else and then yeah you had basically a year off from appearances on on movies which i think this one now because it was a tie between you and Jerry for most guest appearances. This now gives you the lead again. Right. And the king, like the Barry Bonds of movies. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about Trap tonight. And Trap was a movie I caught opening day. I was looking forward to it. I When I saw the trailer originally, it, it didn't register as M. Night right away. And I was really into two things. The premise and also Josh Hartnett coming out of retirement essentially to become a, a leading actor again now that he's in his 40s and i thought he was great in oppenheimer from what i saw in the trailer i thought okay this guy's doing something kind of interesting here and the idea of oh this concert is a whole sabotage to get this serial killer how's he going to get out of this that's a that's a great idea that's a fantastic idea it felt like old school m night and I was excited to go watch this movie. But then I sat down and it was one red flag after another. And by the halfway point, I was like, this, this feels like M. Night is back, but in a bad way. The bad M. Night is back. <laughs> but I don't know. What was your experience with this movie? First in the promotional phase of it, the marketing. And then when you finally did get to sit down and watch it. Yeah, I was so hyped for this movie. That was this was one of my must sees of the year. I'm, I'm I'm a big M Night guy. I've always liked him, and even his lesser films, 
I think you and I have agreed that even when he misses, he swings as hard as he can. And one of the things I admire mostly about him is at least for the last, I don't know, 10 years, he's been self-financing all of his movies, including this one. He put up $30 million of his own money to make this one. Ooh. And that kind of risk is, I think, what sets him apart from most filmmakers, even, even not stylistically, if you want to get into that, of course. But anyway, so this one to me had a real, I mean, I just loved the trailer. I, I love the way it was shot in, it, it does translate in the film with great cinematography and there felt like there was a, a claustrophobia that was really going to be, be uh, built into this film. And Josh Hartnett, I've always enjoyed as a lead actor. So I thought that combination, and like you kind of mentioned with the formula, uh, being a cat and mouse kind of story, and then with the technical approaches it looked like he was going to take, it looked to me like this was going to be his attempt at this kind of classic Hitchcockian style suspense thriller. And and I thought there's got to be something too. Uh, he, he plays his hand really heavily in the trailer and reveals that Hartnett is the killer from the beginning. So I said, uh -huh. there's, there's got to be some way he's going to turn it on, on its face in the end. And when I saw it, what I saw in the film was half of an ambitious take or, or a modern take on trying to make a new Hitchcock style movie and trying to tap into maybe his roots and, but add a little bit more of a budget into it. But on the other hand, I found a movie that just really wanted to be funny and goofy and really mesh these tones together that I thought were entirely opposite. I think there was plenty of room to be funny and to be satirical, but I thought that he leaned way too heavy into that. I think a big element of this film that might have bogged him down was giving his daughter a platform, which he didn't do it totally shamelessly. But in that second and third act of the film, it takes over and it yeah. completely sucks away the wins that the first act might have had. So it is a bit of a disappointment to me. I think it's got its merits. I didn't hate it. But this is the second one in a row now by him that I haven't been really, you know, really, yeah, crazy about. I didn't like Knock at the Cabin. That put me to sleep. And this one didn't put me to sleep. It's entertaining, but it's just not at all what I wanted it to be, or it's a fraction of what I wanted it to be. That's a good observation that the film doesn't have the confidence, maybe, to take itself seriously its premise seriously, and I think it really could have. And if they had, then you get a much better film than what we wind up with. Instead, it's clear that M. Night has an idea of what this is in his head, and Josh Hartnett also does. And, you know, there have been people on X who are like, oh, they've really been gassing this movie up, but specifically his performance. Saying, oh, you know, if the Academy was, was worth their salt, they would acknowledge it. Josh I saw exactly perform. that post okay, you, maybe maybe two hours ago. Yeah, yeah. me too, me too. And, and they're, they're essentially making the case, this is one of the best leading performances of the year. No, no, it's not. It could have been, it could have been. Here, so here's the thing. If you don't know anything about M. Night, you don't know anything about Josh Hartnett or his acting history, you could walk into this movie, sit down and watch it and go, wow. He's acting really poorly, and everyone's acting really poorly. Why are they delivering the dialogue in this manner? And I think what happened here was that Josh Hartnett put his trust into M. Night to match his vision of what this character was going to be. And M. Night probably had the same vision of that, of, okay, there's a clear level of artifice with this guy because he leads a secret life. But then that doesn't really translate and what M. Night does when composing the film and stringing it together and locking it into what it winds up being. And so it's it's this weird, artificial, not believable, and not really funny performance from Josh Hartnett that feels like if you were to sit down and watch Dexter, but without Michael C. Hall's inner monologue as the narration of the show because he does a similar thing and it makes other people around him look dumb. If you just only got his verbal performance with the other actors, it'd be like, why is this guy acting this way? It's like watching the Big Bang Theory without the laugh track. The context kind of removes any sense of 
the greater element that's in play here, which is that, okay, he's trying to fool these people and it's actually work for him to just make small talk and put up this front that he is this person that they think he is. And that's a big problem with this because you don't get that with Josh Hartnett. You only get the facade. And so every interaction is this force thing. And it got some laughs out of me, especially when he's dealing with his daughter and he's like pointing down at this open avenue at the concert. And he's like, hey, maybe we should go down there and explore that. And she's like, what are you talking about, dad? You're being weird. I, I thought that was pretty funny. And I didn't mind those moments, but to what you said as well, where it veers off and becomes a brand new movie after the one hour mark, I think that was a total misstep. And it almost reeks of Kevin Smith with him propping his daughter up and saying, okay, we've had enough of Josh Hartnett. Now let's focus on somebody else and let's focus on my daughter. Well, at least Lady M. Raven. Night's daughter isn't actually J. Mew's daughter. Or, so. yeah, well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> you can clearly tell that's M. Night's daughter. Why? No, no, no. We're not going to get into that. Uh, no, yeah, about Hartnett, it was interesting to me because I, I found his performance fun and I thought he I thought he did a good job for the most part, but I think you're right that so th that extra layer was missing. He's very, and I've used this term a couple times today, uh, not on the show, but just casually. It's it's a bit surface level. We don't really get to kind of carve into who he is, and we don't really explore that duality of his. Because even when the jig is up at the end, he's still that same kind of goofball guy there, there's maybe one or two minor moments where the darkness in him is is kind of shown but he he always keeps that tongue-in-cheek kind of quality to him and if the whole movie was going to be that way that's one thing but it's that narratively it just goes off the rails and it becomes it doesn't become a cat and mouse game anymore it doesn't become claustrophobic at all it becomes a chess game between this cunning serial killer and this young pop star and is that the movie that i wanted no i would have been totally fine with m night's daughter being a centerpiece of the movie with her concert being the the set piece focus that's totally fine like wouldn't care but once it becomes she she gets a big beefy supporting role and it is a huge catalyst in the story it's already gone too far by that point with other thematic elements that aren't clicking, but that's where it just, I think, phones it in and says, "Well, it's gonna. She's gonna be the hero now. She's gonna, she's gonna help everybody overcome and, and thwart Hartnett, or is she?" So, so what comes out of all this is a movie that has the right cast and has so many technical things going for it and has the opportunity to be something immensely claustrophobic, even though you're in this giant space of an arena and it just turns into this mixed bag of, of just three different movies. And it, by the end, I was just kind of scratching my head and especially at the ending scene. There's a, there's a total abandon of reality with this movie. There are so many leaps of logic that don't make sense that you can just register as that wouldn't happen in the real world. Or why is this character doing this? Or why is he behaving this way? And the one thing that sticks out the most to me, and it's probably not even the most egregious example, comes toward the end when they figure out, oh, well, he is, the the character, the killer's name is what, the Ripper? They just call yeah, him uh, the butcher. The butcher, which okay. very lazy name, by the I, way. Yeah, I was just about to say that they could have taken an extra second to think of a another word to use. They, they of might butcher. have. They might as well have named him the Killing Killer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it was a really poor choice. And there's an a moment that comes toward the end when the police finally apprehend him and they're about to put him in the back of the police car, and he stops in front of the bicycle that's on his lawn and pulls out the tool that's going to set him free later on and it's just like the police would never ever in a million years do this with a serial killer they wouldn't do this with a jaywalker that they tracked down and dragged out of his like get the fuck out of here that you're gonna play this is how the movie's ending here but there's a lot of leaps of logic throughout the whole film and that is just one example of that well usually there's... i'm pretty forgiving 
to logic issues in movies because sometimes these things need to happen in order for you to see the movie that you want to see. But in this one, it's just too many. It's not even instances where he gets lucky. It's instances where even me, who I, I'm so forgiving toward this in movies, when you have four or five characters in a row, just kind of like, yeah, I'll let you do this very conspicuous thing that should not be allowed at a very high security event. Sure. Like another another huge one is when he threatens the uh, the pop star, uh, Lady Raven. And she, uh, I think she maybe says something to her security and she lets him go in the in the green room with her alone. I mean, I, you know, this isn't me gatekeeping or anything, but working with talent like that before in, in my past and in my career, no circumstance, especially if it's somebody that big, like think out of like essentially a Taylor Swift type, that never happens. Some rando going into a green room alone, it, things like that would never happen. Um, it, it's just too many times in a row that it asks a lot from the viewer of like, yeah, oh yeah, see, this is how he's been getting by all these years. And it's like, anybody else would be caught in about two weeks if they were trying to trying to kill people and be this just brazenly uh, careless with everything they were doing. And, and as far as like the serial killer lore also goes, he sets up these dummy houses, I guess, where he keeps people and... There's no rhyme or reason, I guess, to the victims because they show an Asian man who's trapped. But then it's also male and female victims that he's taken and killed. And the FBI expert who is supposed to be this, you know, Donald Pleasant style character who's tracking him down. It's just this old lady. And it's all very, to use your word, uh, it's surface. It's extremely surface. It's, oh, he's got mommy issues, so he wasn't accepted by his mom or something, and that's why he's doing all this. Well, not but to then... mention, I think, it, I, I should know the actress's name, and uh, I'm not going to look at it right now, but it's very funny how they use her character. She Everything that's of substance that she apparently says, he hears secondhandedly from somebody else. And then every time you see her, it's she just, you, you see a profile of her walking in a room, she turns and kind of doesn't say anything and, and and that's it like that's almost every scene that she has she does nothing nothing of weight there's no weight when she walks around she's just i guess an antagonist for you to to latch on to but she doesn't say or do anything that really dignifies that uh not tommy lee jones-esque at all no, and there's nothing that would ever indicate with Josh Hart and his character either that he's got a nasty side to him that would leak out of his serial killing, like all serial killers have. Like, oh, usually the home life is kind of a fucked up situation. Usually the wife somehow knows and she's just kind of ignoring all of that for the convenience of raising her kids and having a nice house and all. And I think Allison Pill, who plays his character's wife could have sold that pretty easily and they don't go that route they go oh well she kind of suspected him and then laid a trap of her own with the ticket and she's and like I guess oh, that's the big twist why did we need that why are you overcomplicating it it's just all these little hoops you're making these characters jump through that you don't need and it could have just been as simple as i don't know maybe she just phoned in and said, hey, I think my husband might be doing, something. you know, not trying to set him up intentionally. I don't know. M. Night, I think, overthought so much of what this movie was supposed to be and wound up sabbing, uh, sabotaging himself in the process. And that is why it's so spread out in terms of the tone and not wanting to commit to that concert, which I think he could have very easily eaten up an hour and a half of time in the concert venue and trying to escape and trying to figure out how to get out of there. It's it's really a shame. And I don't want to like bash Salika Knight Shyamalan's acting, but she's definitely really good. You, you pronounced that name quite well. You know, uh, well, I'm you know, I, I've been accused of looking Indian at times by my AI face app. You know, when they would do like the racial exchange of we'll we'll show you what you look like black and Asian and Indian. Well, one time it came up white, which registered me as Indian, which I think is just because I got a more oval face and a mustache that if I was brown, I could totally live and thrive in Bollywood, I think. 
So. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to have to look into that software too. I want to see what it looked like as an Indian man. No, that wouldn't work for you. That way, I can't see that nearly as well as I think most people could imagine me as an Indian person. You, it's a real imaginative stretch. Oh, well, okay, fine. I guess everybody has their niche. I mean, you don't really see Indians with long hair or headbands. That's true. Yeah, they, they yeah, they're, it's always glasses you see them with. It's that's the only that's the only piece they ever wear. It's, the only accessory, of yeah, course, glasses. No matter what, even if they have twenty twenty vision. Yeah. So, so M Night, of course, another famous Indian, M Night Shyamalan, the man himself, does his Hitchcock cameo as the uncle, I, I believe, of Lady Raven, right? Who's responsible for picking? Do you remember what the term they used was to decide a girl in the audience who's going to go up on stage and dance? The yeah, what do they call it? The like dream girl or or think, it's yeah, something think like it, that. It's something like that. A dreamer girl. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You were pretty close. So, all right, the dreamer girl selection. And I actually thought it was pretty funny that Josh Hartnett is like, yeah, my daughter over here, she just beat leukemia and she's getting her confidence. Don't bring it up. She's just getting her confidence back. And M. Knight, the kind hearted man he is, decides, all right, well, she's going to be the dreamer girl. And, you know, another problem I had was that you have this character who is the mother of one of the daughter's friends and she keeps popping up she's almost set up as this foil who's going to have some sort of greater influence on how that story unfolds and she doesn't it just it's a plot line that doesn't really go anywhere it's oh his daughter he so we didn't even really set up the whole thing here but josh hartnett is a father whose name is cooper and he's taking his daughter riley to a lady raven concert and lady raven is her favorite singer and he bumps into the mother of one of her friends or ex-friends because she's got some sort of conflict going on in her school where maybe they disinvited her to some sort of dance-related thing. And so there's a, there's a friction there. But they both happen to be at the concert. Those ex-friends of hers are at the concert as well. The mother runs into Cooper, Josh Hartnett, when he's going off to the bathroom, but he's actually like trying to figure out what is going on with this this whole concert why are there police everywhere why is there a SWAT team running down the hall and she tries to mend fences a little bit and then she gets more threatening she gets a little aggro towards him and essentially he's like you don't want to get on my bad side and it kind of feels like okay is she going to be responsible in some way for this man's downfall before he leaves the concert because she is you know, the top contender for that. But it turns out to just kind of be a red herring situation. And that whole storyline winds up going nowhere. And really, the daughter becomes less and less consequential to the plot the longer into the movie you go, which is unfortunate because I really enjoyed everything that was set up between Cooper and Riley and Cooper trying to be the good dad and balancing that with, oh, fuck, they know I'm here at this concert and I'm a serial killer and I have to continue to go take long bathroom breaks and get myself out of this situation. I think, you know, so I was a big fan of that. It's just, it really, really, really fucks itself up the second he gets out of there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that goes to what you were saying a little bit earlier that it, it, they should have just stayed in that one setting because once or if he has to get out right i think you don't make it this whole act of the film because that's where it just completely crumbles and then there's a, a sequence in the house where m Knight's daughter just again uh, lady raven just traps herself in the bathroom for three minutes to just do a scene on like facetime or something like that and and, and it, there's no real consequence to the scene because all he does is he opens the door and then he just brings her into the car. And then that has no consequence because remember that too is when um, it's when they're in the car and he's essentially taking her ransom. So now the, the daughter is completely out of the picture. And now it's Lady Raven is now his uh, hostage. And it's as simple as she says something to him to the effect of a, trying to be like his mom and then he very briefly goes into this state of psychosis and she just 
slowly pops the door open and just steps out and he sees it, and it's not like this ironic or aha or gotcha moment it's just incredibly anticlimactic and again it, it's another symptom of where i think this movie and m night collectively lost the vision of the possibilities of just staying in that arena and saying well how can this be a situation where not only one it's intense because the the, the character is being watched over by essentially 30,000 people and then secondly how do we root for this person knowing what we know about them that's I mean, that's plenty interesting enough and i thought there would be so much possibility to experiment visually in this kind of concert setting and then you'd have plenty of possibilities with run-ins with security run-ins with uh, maybe other parents or maybe he has to kill somebody inside the venue to keep his cover so many things like that could have happened but that's just kind of ushed aside for well no let's have him kind of just hop skip and jump his way out and then make the whole second or at least the, the whole third act this pop star thwarting him and 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 getting his goat pretty much you know and, you you mentioned before too you've worked with high profile famous people and just the simple talking one-on-one -on -one in a green green room would not happen without security present how about her disappearing for the remainder of the night with her limousine driver nobody goes looking for her nobody tries to get in contact with her at all she just kind of winds up at his home having a slice of pie and everything's hunky-dory there's no effort made to say hey what happened to what happened to the the millionaire famous pop star that all these people showed up for that was at this concert and also we didn't wind up finding the killer at all what's the and, deal and not to mention there's there's so many things to unpack with that like because it's funny uh it was like when i worked for the rock who i mean is one of the biggest stars on the planet and i, I didn't get to talk to him personally and part of that was that he is surrounded all day by at least five to ten people so he's got a, uh, a former like green beret that watches his every move and make sure that he's safe then he's got two personal assistants and he's got his social media assistant then he has his person that takes the pictures for his social media so he has around 10 people at any given time around him when he's going from point a to point b to shoot something or whatever a, a person like this would have the same kind of entourage around them so not 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 just their one like security guy that have all their people that run their day to day and that just poof they go away and then not to mention on top of that she's part of this massive fbi sting like she's mm -hmm. she's in on the on the on the on the jig right and so she would have the entire intelligence apparatus around her <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's just that she just plucked out of thin air like nothing has happened and oh sure i'll i'll drive off my route even though i probably have to get on a plane the second i leave this arena no way i'll go over to the uh i'll go over to the antagonist's house and i'll have yeah tea and crumpets with them it, it's i and again i'm somebody who's very forgiving of logic issues in movies but there was just a point where and and this isn't as me this is me saying it as somebody that's just worked with high profile people it's just who would even believe this chick for one second obviously she feels unsafe and she's trying to uh save face and trying to figure out how she can pin him down but who would comply with this like the, the limo driver wouldn't nobody would no and it, it's very difficult to fit like to comprehend that m night after so many movies and working for I think every single studio, every single major studio that's left, right? We got uh, Disney. This is Warner Brothers. I think he might have worked for Sony at one point. What was it After Earth, the Will Smith movie? Probably, yeah, yeah. Something along those. And, you know, I don't know who did Airbender. But this is a guy who's been firmly planted in the industry since the 90s. And he knows it better than anyone. I, I He's just kind of operating, I guess, as... The person who who handled the script 
under the assumption that the audience is clueless and dumb and that you know i i think he's the primo example of a director who fumbles great concepts almost every single time old was a similar situation where i really enjoyed the twilight zone nature of what that was and then by the end of it i was like okay this is how you chose to to end it i know we had talked about it where he had two young actors playing the characters that managed to survive the whole ordeal in old and he swaps them out with two older actors of zero note instead of just throwing some old age makeup on what was it nat wolf or whoever was playing the lead character and the sister or girlfriend it's been a while since i've watched old folks that that one i actually enjoyed and i just forgave a couple of the choices that that he made and then i thought mostly in that one for me uh just some of the acting from the lead actors who were not typically leading people which was i think in one instance a good choice from him uh i think was just a little subpar it seemed like tv actors trying to take a big swing for film acting but josh hartnett is not that guy he's very capable he's always been uh, a strong at least supporting character and then when he's had the opportunity to lead he's he's pretty good he's always been a fairly ca charismatic guy and i think he's the only thing that keeps this movie from sinking any lower for me or even from a general audience because he uh, i know you say at points his performance is bad i i think it's just the writing right well, no no the, no I, let, let, let me be clear about that because i don't think it's bad because he can't act I think it's bad because he was going for something and he trusted M Knight and M Knight didn't deliver on the other half of that. Right. He didn't he didn't help help him get to the finish line with what he was trying to do. And so I don't I don't fault Josh Hartnett at all for his performance in this movie. I fault M Knight for not doing what was necessary to make it work because clearly they had agreed upon okay, this is what the character is going to behave like and deliver lines like. And I think in the right context and in, in the right uh, editing style, that does gangbusters. And for this movie, it comes in funny and it doesn't really do much else. It goes funny to what are you doing? Why are you, t why are you, why are you handling this social exchange this way? And it could have been great. It could have been a lot better. Maybe not great. It could have been a lot better. It's just to me that, um, I think if Hartnett's not there, I, th I think this movie sinks even further. Because oh, yeah, I agree. He, he, he levels this movie up with his natural kind of charisma to where you almost believe it for a good chunk of the movie. And again, if let's let's hone in on this because I really think the, the, the structure of the plot and of the writing is where this falls apart because everything else is, still holds up. Great cinematography and... Uh, they shot it on Super 35, and you can really see that image quality mm -hmm. and that image texture, which makes it uh, a lot of fun just to look at. But um, in terms of the plot structure, you would almost buy it if a lot of these goofy choices were still in there and it gave Hartnett a reasonable vehicle to let this character navigate this whole situation. But when it passes off the reins from him, again to the lady raven character the audience their faith in the in the story and in the performance is betrayed in my opinion because now it it, it becomes someone else's movie and 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 again uh like you said uh Saleka night Shyamalan, she's she's fine there, there's nothing wrong with anything she does performance wise but it's very clearly shown that at a certain point of the movie Hartnett himself and the Cooper character is even cast aside to where you might think, ah, oh, well, this could be some kind of fun character study, but they don't dig deep enough into the character of Cooper. So what you're given is, like we've kind of agreed, a surface level interpretation of a serial killer that's trying to get by with a family in the modern world. But everything Hartnett does is, uh, is I think, betrayed add in the script and it's funny completely getting into the script uh m night has been really excited about this movie 
probably the most excited I've seen him about a movie uh, he's made in a while. Let and me he... tell you, not to interrupt you, I was watching him do an interview on one of these YouTube channels that had interviewed Tarantino previously, and they brought up, oh, you know, we talked to Tarantino, and he, he's starting to feel like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was just so good that he better not even really make a 10th film, a 10th and final film, because maybe he should just go out on top. And M. Night was like, yeah, I've been actually thinking that as well with Trap. I think maybe I might not be able to make a better movie than Trap. Maybe this is it. for. Maybe I should just end it here. And I was like, but, uh, what? I was uh, discombobulated hearing that, that he would even think that. I mean, I'm glad he's got his confidence up because I'd rather a, a stupidly confident M. Night making big budget studio movies than a low confidence and also shitty M. Night, like Avatar, The Last Airbender era M. Night, knowing he's really just making total pieces of shit. But, I mean, it, it's a ridiculous notion. Anyway, sorry, what were you about to go on with? Well, the funny thing was he, he's been, he was promoting it online for weeks and, and giving tidbits of information of behind the scenes, oh, this is what we did for this, and we shot it this way. And one of the things that he really latched onto that he wanted people to know, he said, well, I want you guys all to know that this was the fastest script I had ever written. I <laughs> no shit. I, he's like, yeah. I wrote it in five months. And he's like, I just breezed through it. And, and me and, and you, by extension, I mean, I write a lot. And um, if I'm doing it full time, five months is a long time for me to get through even a couple drafts. Um, so initially, I said, that's the, that's the fastest you've ever written something. And then additionally... <laughs> like you just said, I see some of the choices and then I see kind of just how it devolves into this mush by the end. And I said, well, yeah, of course you wrote it faster than anything else. You gave up on the main plot and you just said, you know what? This is Salika's movie. She's, yeah. she's, she's going to take the reins. It feels like a first draft of a script. These exactly. kinds of issues that we're talking about, the stupidity in the writing that's things that you would typically iron out with subsequent drafts. And so for him to not have figured that out as such a veteran filmmaker and screenwriter, again, he started as a screenwriter before he started directing. He was a work for hire guy who, what did he do? He did like 10 things I hate about you. Stuart Little. He, he, Stuart Little. He ghost penned a lot of scripts in the nineties for these big movies that were successful. And this feels just like a dumb early draft of a script. But, you know, the idea for Trap came about from two things, and this is really the problem. It was him wanting to do a Purple Rain-style concert film, and he realized, oh, I could just do that for my daughter because she's an R&B singer. She's not the director. I almost watched, by the way, Watchers on HBO Max. Which oh, is it's not a total waste. Do not see it. Yeah, it, the trailer had the same exact vibe as all the M night movies I've disliked, which is you got second. something hold, interesting. Hold on one second. I'm just realizing two movies in one year that M night ushed in both of his daughters into the scene. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was using trap as a facade for something else. Um, because between watchers, which quick review on that, a total dud, they got a good cinematographer and that's it. It's, M. Knight's daughter doing a take on an Irish Celtic folktale. And uh, no, it goes together like M. Knight's daughter and a Celtic folktale go together like <laughs> lamb and tuna fish. Um, so there's that. And and then this one with uh, Seleka's performance and, and highlighting her for more than half the movie. Now I'm seeing what was going on this year. Yeah. M. Knight wanted to build the dynasty this year. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just put those two things together. I guess he was successful at it. You know, Trap, when it came out opening weekend, I don't think that the box office was impressive. But when I looked it up before the show, it had a budget of $30 million. It wound up making $70 million during its run in theaters. Now, it's obviously, still in theaters. It probably it? will get another week or two. So it might pull in another five, maybe even 10 mil. And then, uh, you know, video on demand and, and Blu-ray sales, it's going to turn a profit. Like, like uh after marketing and everything, it, they usually say make three times what what you spent on it. But he's, again, I credit him, and this is why he has carte blanche and didn't have to do another draft, is 
he's paying for the movie out of pocket and he's producing. So he has nobody to answer to, even from the studios. Um, he's going to make a profit on this. And in, in a sense, I'm happy because I like how entrepreneurial he is. And uh, it, it, it's a real testament to how much he loves filmmaking and, and the value that he puts on his creative vision, even when he, even when he misses. Um, so I do hope it turns a, a profit and I mean, it already is, but it's just, uh, yeah, even for, oh, I guess, I guess I don't want to trail off too long. You were going to make a point about it. Well, I was going to say between that and then watchers, from my experience before I even knew that was his daughter originally had good word of mouth, like girls I had worked with at a photography studio were talking about that movie and how it was good and scary. And, you know, it's all Gen Z. So I'm like, I can completely dismiss whatever you're saying right now, but people were still talking about it and you don't really see, I mean, honestly, for the most part, I don't experience people talking about movies unless they're really, huge so for that to come up and then i threw the trailer for watchers on and to what i was saying before the trailer exhibited the same problem as any m night movie which is that okay i'm on board for what you're showing me here at the beginning and then the longer it went on i was like i don't want to sit down and watch this i'm i think i'm good here and so i didn't watch it although maybe it would have been interesting to compare that with with trapped uh, trap, excuse me, and uh, have both M Night daughters as a as a subject for a show. Well, but I can I can contrast to that really quickly. Sure, At, and a lot of people would think I'm yeah, I'm, I'm trashing Trap. I'm actually not. <laughs> Part of me enjoyed things, but it, it's it was just that it was such a letdown for me. But no, that's will... that's where I'm at with it too. I think a bad M Night movie is still a better watch than a bad other person's movie. So M. Night, I, you know, because he does swing for the fences and he has a particular house formula that I enjoy, I still like his failures more than I would like maybe just a standard good enough film. So I didn't feel like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have spent $48 on movie tickets at this shitty little theater because I overpriced it on M. Night's Trap. I still felt like, all right, well, I want to go see an M. Night movie in theaters. And that's the best thing I could really ask for from him or from a lot of directors, really. Yeah, and then for me, it's... Um, and th this is, I guess, where we can take a positive turn uh, on the movie because I, I think we've made the, the problems with the film very pronounced. And uh, there's a number of them. But to kind of touch on the contrast between something like Watchers, which is, which is something that wants to be way more art house, and you can tell that M. Night kind of just took his daughter's hand and walked her through this from day one all the way to, to rap, but let her keep some creative influence. Uh, something like that that wants to be meandering and and artful and something contemplative. And then M. Night, who says, no, uh, my movies have their own distinct identity. I like to have fun with them. Even in the more serious ones, there's always some tongue-in-cheek, like, like some of the humor and signs. And then uh, even, yeah, I mean, science is probably the, the best example when the the tongue in cheek in the comedy works well. But this one at least has an energy to it. You never get bored watching it. That's that's the one thing. The, the only scenes that do teeter on boring is when they zero in on Lady Raven and you have to switch gears and begin to root for her, which you don't want to do. But the movie never gets truly unexciting whereas the watchers i think put me i think it put me to sleep twice <laughs> at different points in the film whereas this one like you said it's a bad movie for m night to make but it's still more entertaining than the other two movies i saw that day which were blink twice and uh strange darling and strange darling was was actually better uh, you but... said hold on i remember you said that blink twice opens with a trigger warning were you making a joke or was that no real? no there's this there is a title card that says, "Hey, just saying, a couple things happen in this. So, you know, if you don't if you don't like watching movies, maybe don't watch this. Which I yeah, think is so funny be because and this is no shade at uh, Zoe Kravitz, and she seems to be a reasonably capable actress. She likes white boys. I'll give her a pass. That's true. Yeah, and uh, well, anyway, uh, no, it's it's just 
and I mean, maybe this is kind of where somebody like M. Night is still a bastion of hope for film, because as opposed to somebody like Zoe Kravitz, who comes on the scene and nepotism, of course, uh, she gets creative reign to make a movie and has the gall, I think, to completely subvert the whole idea of filmmaking by putting a trigger warning on her movie. That's never something you're going to see with M. Night, and he's unrelenting in his own authenticity, whether you like it or not, and he will pay out of pocket to make sure that you see the version he's always wanted and that's i mean that's where i that's why i'm always excited when a film from him is announced and that's why i think most people kind of like how you mentioned you heard some people talk maybe it was the watchers they were talking about but it's why even your normie uh your normie kind of jaded disillusioned moviegoer because now even seeing films is a subculture which is ridiculous to me um, your your jaded individual of today still knows his name has some weight to it, and that's why people still talk about his movies, and it's um, it's that's why it's still fun, and that's why even though Trap has all these critical issues, you still come out out of it saying, eh, yeah, it was it was dumb, but at least I had fun at at times. Right. I think the best thing I can say about it, if I'm forgiving of all of the very sloppily conducted plot points is that it feels like an amusement park ride and it's it, it, to what you said it's definitely one of the more entertaining films i've probably seen at the theater this year so i'll give it credit for that um you know there was a i was going to bring this up before so originally he was contemplating the idea of doing a purple rain concert film style movie and then he tailored that to his daughter because of her music career uh, he's the best dad ever first of all for that and then mm -hmm. there's this other thing that happened in 1985 that was a sting operation where they lured in maybe it was a sex offender they do i know they do that with conventions and whatnot even still and they will bag like 30 of these guys but there was a there was some type of um event that they had lured a criminal to under the guise of, oh, you can get free Super Bowl tickets. And they nabbed him that way. And he had an idea for that. And so clearly, everything we're saying here is what happened. It's he grabbed these two clashing ideas, tried to merge them together. Or maybe he just got bored with the second one. Maybe he realized in the in the script, he's like, I can only do so much here. My my brain's only coming up with so many ideas for what he can get himself into. Although it kind of seems like if you really sat on, if you committed to it, it's endless. You could have you could have figured out so much with that. That could have been really interesting to unfold. And where it winds up going in that action film form, where there's moments that should be high stakes that you don't feel any sort of drama or conflict. Like somehow his family has no idea that he's a serial killer. Okay, fine. I'll believe that. I'll bite. Then he brings home the pop star. Okay. I already don't like this, but we're here. I'll play along with it. And then they all just kind of weirdly turn on him and they don't question it all when he has that moment where uh, she nabs his phone and runs off to the bathroom. And it's that moment where, boy, the the real panic is if uh, if you feel the the familiarity of someone picking up your phone that you don't want picking up your phone is they're gonna find some naughty things on there. They're not supposed to be fine, you know that type of thing. And he tears the door, or he's about to tear the door down. He's trying to get in. She's live stream. She's on Instagram or whatever the hell she's doing. She's watching the little Korean well, man. Well, yeah. Room. If I can shed light on that for one second, this is a, a total personal thing for me. I know the world we live in right now, but I adamantly vehemently hate when films rely on phones or modern technology as a shortcut to move the plot forward. And it happens here because what did she do? Like you said, she, nabs his phone she says oh let's take a selfie with the daughter he and she nabs his phone goes in the bathroom does an instagram live is that technically logical yes i hate it in a cinematic form because it just it's a shortcut to solve so many problems and i think from a writing standpoint any writer today should challenge themselves to 
avoid that as much as humanly possible. And that's where M night, where he had an hour and a half before this to, I think, craft a more clever kind of cat and mouse game. If you want it to go that direction. And he's just, it comes down to, Oh, they want to tell it, take a selfie. And she snatches the phone, frees the guy, does an Instagram live. And that's what gets everybody to turn on him. And that, that to me just takes the air out of any of the tension that you have, uh, that, Maybe he will do something to her. Maybe maybe he's going to kill this this pop star. But no, the the, the power of of the grid, so to speak, uh, saves the day. His character starts to remind me not in performance, but in what he's able to get away with. He starts to remind me of Heath Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight, where yeah, he's he's now driving the limousine and he's dressed up like a cop and then he gets out and they shoot the you know he's doing so much in a short period of time and actually there's a tunnel that leads over to the neighbor's yard that nobody ever noticed in 40 years oh all right and then he gets back in and he's like this master sleuth but then he gets caught and they feel bad for him and he nabs the little fucking thing that gets him out of his handcuffs all right all right um it's just it i think i just can't get over the wasted potential of the movie and that's the biggest insult and the, the the most demeaning element when watching it as an audience member is the trailer even promised something that was better than what was delivered and maybe not i don't feel like it was a total deception like something like suicide squad back in 2016 or maybe the trailer dropped in 2015 where it's like these are two separate movies but it just i don't know it it was uh it was a big miss from M Night, not it the worst been, M Night, but oh yeah, far from the worst. It just it just could have been a lot of things. It could have been on one hand, it could have been a very claustrophobic kind of tense thriller that he leaned into the 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 hardest and the most uh, Hitchcockian elements and made something very tense and didn't have any of the levity. Or it could have been a funhouse movie. Essentially, that would have been a great possibility in exploring all the nooks and crannies of this kind of venue. And what could somebody do to spring themselves out of trouble and then have a little tongue in cheek humor, but, but still keep that undercurrent of, of tension because Shyamalan can be a master of suspense, but instead what, yeah, what we've kind of agreed has happened has been, he opted out of all that and just said, well, we're just going to, we're just going to drive this baby wherever it goes and, and, and we'll just finish it. And that's, that's really how it feels by the end of the movie that maybe you, because you touched on it as well, maybe there was a point where he said, I don't know what to do anymore. And it just feels like he kind of gave up on the movie at a certain point and it listly moves on until it finally ends. And th that's just what we're left with. But all the while, somehow, whether it's because of Josh Hartnett's performance, whether it's because of M. Night's competency as a director even when he makes these colossal mistakes there's something that keeps you going through it uh, certainly more than again anything else that's really contemporary so somehow there, there's these interesting elements but for most audiences i think well i would actually say for most audiences this might be a decent diversion for guys like us that are so steeped into films and really try to have a nuanced and uh, insightful look into things there's a lot of disappointments here, but on the other, on the other hand, I could totally see anybody kind of, maybe a young guy like wants to watch a movie with his girlfriend, like Netflix style thing at home. This is one that I think would actually be maybe a decent diversion for the average viewer. They'd still have their, they would, they would still have their problems with it, but I think it's a movie that could get a lot of forgiveness from a general audience. You know, it's kind of impressive, too, that it managed to recoup its budget and then some. I just realized, and maybe it's just because these movies have been hanging on to their theatrical screenings for way longer than normal. I think it either opened against or the following weekend of Deadpool and Wolverine and Twisters. And so it finished third place when it opened a month ago. And it doesn't it feels like longer than that, but it finished in third place about a month ago. Uh, making back about 15, I think it was 15 million. Yeah. Uh, wait. Eh, yeah, 15 million, 15.5 million. So it got halfway to what it needed 
uh, to start to turn a profit if we ignore, okay, the theaters actually take half and yada, yada, yada. I've coined 2024 as the year of the punished auteur. And this might be an example of that. Not in box office, clearly, because it, it, it got over the finish line, probably just narrowly what would be considered safely. But the reviews are reflecting that. And uh, it reminds me of, because you mentioned he staked his own money on this. And this is, it, what, his company is what? Bleeding Edge? Or? Uh, blinding Edge. Blinding Edge. That's right. Have you been able to see Horizon? Oh, yeah, yeah. I caught it. Horizon's a similar situation where Warner Brothers decided to put a lot on one particular filmmaker and his risky idea. Although, I don't think that they contributed nearly as much to Horizon as they did to Trap. And it might have been the same amount of money that was waged. I can't recall. What, what were your thoughts on Horizon? I liked it. I mean, it... it... I think it has its issues only if you look at it as an episodic entry. But Matt, I, you know, you mentioned it just a second ago. You said the the tortured auteur, and I can't for the life of me see the effort that Costner put into the film and the the actual love and the dedication he put into the film. I mean, and he left that pile of dog crap show Yellowstone to do this, and that to me that's an easy paycheck because as bad as that show is. Uh, he could have kept riding the wave and collecting the big paycheck. And he said, you know what? TV sucks. I'm going back to movies and I don't care. I'm going to burn the bridge and give up that paycheck, spend my own money to make a movie I want to see in a movie I think needs to be made. It's a little melodramatic at times. And I think um, it kind of plods along, but I can't lie and say for a minute, I wasn't entirely engrossed in the movie and the production and just the, the overall scope of what was going on. So it's not Dances with Wolves, but it's still good. And, and it's disappointing a little bit that audiences didn't seem to latch on to that. But I think that's because, it, like, kind of like how I said a few minutes ago, the casual audience member today is just so jaded. And event films like Horizon that are these big budget event Western films they're, they don't carry the same gravity anymore because of the, for one, the average attention span of the modern kind of typical moviegoer. And then people don't rally around films the same way unless it's a niche. And luckily, I think in the, the, in the thriller sphere, that's in thrillers and horror, it, uh, a genre that M. Night very much owns, there's still some excitement around that because people still like the, the amusement park kind of ride of the emotional ups and downs of those kinds of movies. But um, I think with Horizon, it, it's just, it's with with an audience that is just, I think, out of time. And Costner, I think, really wanted to, and he, well, he really said he wanted to bring people back to the movies. And it, it was just a, a time in people that weren't ready for it. And yeah, fortunately, Shyamalan still has the clout to to do that like we said a few minutes ago yeah unfortunately he didn't but i guess hugh jackman did 60 year old hugh jackman uh which i i listen i'm an offender there and i kind of feel bad in retrospect because i knew oh, damn this is still contributing to the disney house of mouse and what's the next headline i read after deadpool and wolverine overthrows the passion of the christ is the top r-rated movie i see Oh, they killed somebody at Disney World by poisoning his food with something he was allergic to. And because he signed up for Disney Plus, you can't sue them, which is fuck. It's insane. It's a crazy situation. But, you know, I mean, I, I saw Horizon opening night and there were four people in my theater. Now, granted, I did see a 1130 at night screening of this three hour plus movie. Right. And I was maybe one of half the theater that was awake by the end of it because we didn't get out until like 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And there were just as many people that showed up for Reagan, which I saw. I went to go see Reagan the other day. And uh, I'll be seeing that this weekend, I believe. But, uh, but people aren't excited to see God the Dipper. Speed. Come on. No, it was, <laughs> listen, it was, it was not, it was not good. You're not, I don't think you're going to be, you might have something kind to say about something because you're a more generous critic than I am with at times but 
I really regret it. I mean, I, I guess maybe I regret's the, not a correct word, but it was probably the worst movie I've seen in the theater this year. I'll say that. I'll definitely say wait, that. Wait, wait, I, I would be totally on board. Do they do a segment where they play uh, the Rap and Ronnie song from the 80s? You know that one, right? No, I don't know that one. It, See, if Hans was, was here, I would have him pull it up immediately. But no, they don't do that. <laughs> I, I mean, what, what I'll give it credit for is they had a budget. They got Gen Phil Collins, Genesis, and Guns N' Roses are on the soundtrack. Dennis Quaid gives a good performance, but the writing's bad, and the person who wrote the script didn't have an idea of what three-act structure was. And also, John Voight is a complete monster in the film. I'm writing a piece for it right now on my Substack, jcorellis.substack.com. I'm dropping, we're recording this early in the morning, 12, 36 a.m., September first sunday it will be dropping later today for my sunday reader and uh go check that out but i'm going to be talking about right-wing films in general and the misfires and successes in that particular genre and reagan in my opinion is a big old miss it's not my son hunter my you know what, what was that you know it's not <laughs> yeah, that yeah. movie but it's not uh, on the level of um you know an s craig zoller film Oh boy! You, see, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play this during the episode, but I'm gonna check this out. Jake just sent me the link to the Rap and Rodney song that he referenced there. The Rap and Rodney Reagan. Yes, sorry, Rap and Rodney is Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, so. that's when. He, yeah, he did a, he did a rap comedy album. I I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, uh, but yeah, I, I I thought I was gonna see it, but. If you're cautioning against it, maybe no. I'll, I mean, I'll... don't let me don't let me steer you away. I'm sure they could use the money. I listen. I, I, I mean, it's I not just see it for free so, because on a list, I just I pay a flat fee a month, and I essentially get I go to the movies three times a week for free after that. So, so I don't know how it calculates out, but it's like I'm literally spending zero dollars to see it. Uh, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> well, then if you got two hours, I will say it's a little too long, but. I still like when movies that are clearly not done by the Hollywood studio, even if they're total piles of shit, wind up coming out looking successful. So I wouldn't mind if that happened. But now I'm starting to see this counter narrative because it has bad reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. I think it has like a 15%. And the conservative audience wants it to be a success, wants it to be good. And so the audience rating is now like 100%. And I'm seeing, you know, these X accounts that make their bread and their bread and butter is just going, oh, well, the left has said this, the liberal said this, so it must be this, actually. And it's like, nah, this is not a case where they're maligning it just because of politics. It's actually just not good. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel like a workable film. But I think it's interesting that it exists, I guess, and that it came out. And I don't like how Reagan's been turned into this villain of modern history by people who weren't even alive for his presidency. This, this I think boogeyman. I saw you pointed out. It was funny because I know exactly when I saw this, you, you had posted something on X about um, like, you must've heard it in passing, but something like a, like some 22 year old in 2024 America saying like groaning and saying, well, Ronald Reagan. And it was so funny because you and I live almost 2,000 miles apart from each other. Within 48 hours of you posting that, the 48 hours before, I had an exact conversation with somebody who at the time was, I think, 22, going on 23. And she had said, oh, my God, I hate Ronald Reagan. And it, because there was a, a documentary on him in the corner. And I said, what do you know about Ronald Reagan? <laughs> yeah. And it, it was like, listen, you... At least I was around to remember when he died. This person literally was maybe, maybe just getting out of diapers when, when good old Alzheimer's sent Ronnie off to the pasture. Um, it's just funny how, like, and th this is the thing uh, that I think is funny about a movie like this Reagan film and then a movie like Horizon 2. These kind of biopics of, of of people in high status like that like presidents were usually seen as commonplace when you and i were growing up and then these kind of event westerns like horizon and now it's somehow they've become antiquated just because of how i think 
again, how jaded and disillusioned the average, even, geez, almost even the average millennial now has be has become with films or, or just seeing a story that may or may not confirm their biases. I mean, that was a big thing with Horizon, too, wasn't it? There was a big stink about some of the representation of uh, of tribal warfare. And Costner, to his credit, actually stood up and said, listen, I'm not here to sugarcoat anything. And if you have an issue with that, like, you're, you're just going to have to move on, I guess. And, it, and Horizon is as benign as it gets when it comes to any sort of ethnic or racial con like he throws black people in to moments where they would definitely not be and then there's also this little very mini storyline with chinese rail workers adopting the prostitute's uh, son so it's like okay you get a little flavor of everything i i but it, it, who cares about any of that i really enjoyed the world building of horizon when it comes to reagan and what you're talking about here the idea of him is this boogeyman. They only know three things. They know he prevented people from getting their HIV medication. He, uh, his wife, Nancy, loved giving blowjobs. Like, who the fuck can prove that? Loved giving blowjobs in her youth. And then, uh, you know, he also dumped schizophrenic homeless people out onto the streets by closing the, uh, you know, the, the mental facilities that they were residing in. Okay, so they know those three things. This man won 49 out of 50 states in his second election. He was, you know, the way that I put it, and I, I talk about Reagan a lot in the article that I'm going to be publishing later today. Reagan, for the longest time, was kind of the Ronald McDonald of America. He embodied so much of the 20th century spirit. He was a cowboy. He was an actor. He had been divorced. And he was popular. He was a well-liked guy. He was a union guy. president. Yes, yeah. And now, he, you know, we've taken this turn where to be patriotic is viewed as a conservative value now. And it wasn't that way before 2016. And frankly, you go on Facebook, you see people's aunts and uncles who are saying, Hey, lock up Trump. Trump should die. Why didn't that bullet miss Trump? And you'll see probably an American flag or something that would go contradictory of whatever you might assume somebody who would vote in the opposite direction would go. But in their head, they've worked it out that way. But this younger generation, the Gen Z, some millennials, to have any sort of pride in your country or your country's history is just now viewed as right wing. And I don't well, think that's the case or it has to be the case. Well, and you know what's really interesting? And this actually ties back into trap, the subject of this conversation. The funny thing is, out of all people, and, and I've been saying this, at least in private conversations, maybe not on, a, a, on like movies or my old podcast for years, has been, it's fascinating to me that M. Night is somebody that understands that, and he always has, and he injects that into his movies, even if it's uh, even if it's subconsciously. And it's fascinating to me because he's obviously, I believe he's actually an immigrant. I think he moved here when he was maybe three years old, but at the very least, he's a very ethnic guy whose parents were from a, a different place, and. Uh, obviously like people put a pun on his name, but he's this guy and he always has in his films. He, he boasts this very Americana view of day-to-day -day life. And that's one of the intangible things I've always liked about his movies. And it's here in trap. What I enjoy that he does here and almost from the get go in this film and that he does in all of his other films is he shows the world and really this kind of, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia bubble he likes to live in, which I think is doubly cool. Uh, he shows it as it is. Mm -hmm. He shows people as they are. He doesn't show this tragic or over romanticized version of the of the country or even of Pennsylvania or Philadelphia at large. He shows it for what it is, and you can tell that he has a genuine love for it, and it, it's it speaks subconsciously in all of his movies and. I think that's something that hopefully, like you were kind of saying with, with audiences right now, and, and just, again, this this weird kind of social paradigm that's come over them where even the, the slightest reverence toward your neighbors or your country seems overtly conservative or something like that. M. Night has this language and the subtext in his films that 
I think allows people to really, really look, look around and kind of immerse themselves in what's good about their society. I mean, I know that's kind of a long diatribe, but I've really noticed it as an ongoing theme in all of his movies, probably tracing back to the first time I saw signs and mm-hmm. then I've paid attention to it, especially since his big comeback. He's always had this, this kind of quality in, in this, uh, I think this, this reverence, this unspoken reverence that he has in his work. Maybe you have. Yeah, no, I would totally second that. I would co-sign that completely. And it's something that I think has informed his work and gives it such a unique flair. I mean, we haven't had a Pennsylvania filmmaker since what George Romero, who loves to go back to that location for almost everything he does. Unless you count um, David Lynch, but he he latched on to his Northwest roots because he grew up in Pittsburgh, I think, but he spent some time in the Northwest and he latched on more to that, but he, he's a Pennsylvania guy. Yeah, he worked in the industrial industry, I believe, when he was starting and made Eraserhead. I saw that you got into Twin Peaks recently, which is like 40 years too late, but better late than never. <laughs> What was the holdup? Yeah. I, I just, oh, geez, life was the holdup. And I think just the litany of things I was told I needed to see, the litany of things that were currently coming out that I wanted to see. And then just between, uh, oh, geez, this, just a whirlwind of life, my friend. I never got the time to sit down and dedicate the energy to watch something like this. And then when I finally did, it's just, bec- it's now become a part of my personality for the better. I feel better for having watched it. And now I'm, a super fan. I Did you get through the, all of it? I got to watch the return, but uh, I like it's next next to my queue. I'm literally days away from starting it. Wow! I you know I kind of feel wish spoiled. I, was you. I get to watch it all at once. Yeah, it was such a moment back in I think it was what 2017 that the return came out. See, Twin Peaks took me I a remember second when it to was get coming into out, it. and and everybody talking about it. It was it was just, uh, it was a huge moment. Yeah, I, I mean. Twin Peaks had a second wind in the Tumblr era where people started grabbing Netflix stills and the caption, and it was memed in that form. And I tried to watch it twice, and it didn't connect with me. And then later on, I think I had finally like penetrated Blue Velvet, and I was like into that movie. I enjoyed that movie. I gave Twin Peaks another shot, and I was like, okay, I understand David Lynch's world now and his style, and this comes easier. And I wound up marathoning the first two seasons. Then the return is announced. Actually, you know what? No. I, then I watched Firewalk. Did you check out Firewalk with me? Yeah, loved it. Okay, loved it. Firewalk with me seems to be, uh, you know, people who who really love Twin Peaks sometimes do not like Firewalk with me. It's gotten this reappraisal as of recent. But uh, even in the in the 90s, when it premiered originally, people thought he was sucking his own dick with that movie and were not responding well to it. And even now, I've show, I've like shown people fire walk with me and it's uh, tepid, you know, but the, the return, I think you have to first set your expectations aside that he's not going to give you what you want. Oh, yeah. 100%. But um, there's a there's a sort of pleasure in understanding that. By a midway point of the series because as soon as i mean i don't want to spoil anything for you but i kind of know what's going on but i i have what do you know away from what do you think you know uh there so i'm aware that cooper is back but he's not really back okay all right that's yeah. all you really need to know that's all you really need to know all right yeah. so on that note watching that over because it wasn't 17 we- i think there were 17 episodes but it wasn't 17 weeks maybe there's 18 episodes they did two episodes a week and so it became this two-hour block of television that you would tune into on showtime and about halfway through that you go oh this isn't going to happen by the end this is not you're not going to get what you want here coop's not going to be fully coop and so you have you know i wind up really liking his second form the form you get in most of the series and really thinking that was a hilarious character and it's made me want to go back many times and there's some episodes there you could just one one off watch and they're great cinema on their own so 
uh, I envy you that you can watch that for the first time all over again because it was such a, a joyous occasion when that premiered. And then how it wound up ending was perfectly David Lynch. So actually, enjoy. Uh, spe speaking of um, Twin Peaks and of, of Cooper, I, the, that movie Blink Twice I saw from mm -hmm. Zoe Kravitz. Not the worst movie ever made, but the most redeeming quality is Kyle MacLachlan is in it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had no idea he was in it, that movie. Yeah, in a, in a small role. Um, so it's, yeah, that that's a treat as a fan because I'm getting through it and I'm like, ah, I know what this movie wants to be. It's not as smart as it thinks it is. Oh, cool, Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I'm stoked to watch that and whether you want to credit it as a uh, uh, Lynch as a Pennsylvania filmmaker, you, there seems to be a very specific kind of filmmaker that comes from Pennsylvania. And it looks like the likes of people like Lynch Romero and even Shyamalan all have these tongue in cheek quirks. So it's gotta be a thing with, it's gotta be a thing it, with uh, these Pennsylvania types. Maybe it's just being in the suburbs, but also being like within a relatively close proximity to the city. So you get exposed to the art and the culture, even if you're kind of far away from it. I there think that's something, something that. that people are going to see as you and I start to make more films. I think people are going to get an actual sense of these kind of Boston bred perspectives because I mean, I have some wild and crazy ideas outside that framework, but uh, I do have some ideas that, take place in the confines of where like you and I grew up. And I think people are going to see that it's way different than what something like that piece of crap movie, the instigators tried oh, to don't sell bash the to instigators. Us. I listen, I enjoyed it enough for an Apple, yeah. for an Apple plus movie. I think it was kind of, I don't know. I know you hated it. You despise that movie. Oh yeah. It, it was it, again. If, if you guys want to follow me on the old letterbox, it is a chat GPT movie about Boston. I, I, I couldn't hate it just because, listen, the same day I watched that movie, I went into North Quincy and I walked over to, I thought I was going to pick up a, a dinner from my mom's favorite uh, dinner spot in Quincy. And I was going to surprise her. And then I found out, oh, they're closed and they're in Greece for two months. So that's a no-go. Okay. But uh, that exact location turns up in the instigator's and it's it's frequently featured throughout. And there's like a bar that Casey Affleck works for there. I was just like, wow, I just lived all this. This is me. This is my life. I, yeah, I'm I, Casey I Affleck. Went to, yeah, I went to school there. I know. It brought back all uh, the good memories mm -hmm. and, and, of living there. But then I just thought, this is so phony. This is, Every line is so in. You would think they, they must have paid a ton of money to, to Affleck and Damon for this. Because, yeah, they like going back home. And even though they were kind of preppy Cambridge boys they weren't really like they didn't come up the way you and I did uh everything is so forced every line is so oh yeah say this like oh it's yeah, almost as stupid as trap Dallas. I'll say that so <laughs> trap I think is a dumber movie but the instigators similarly there are leaps of logic in the film that these characters take and it doesn't make sense and some characters are in it and then just like who cares what happens even though they're name actors like they clearly spent a lot of money on the film and then didn't bother i mean honestly it's the same same deal as trap in that it feels like a first draft it feels like you didn't bother to polish up the script here you just had the names and you went ahead because you could and it was the same guy who did roadhouse earlier this year which i thought was a trip i really enjoyed roadhouse. oh yeah yeah that was fun the, the funny thing is uh the kindest review i could give to the instigators it's like if and this is a tease to everybody out there in the audience is uh the instigators is like if you did a spoof of mass state lottery it, uh, no i don't even put it in the same setting in that way i no, i would no, say it's far it's, away from mass state lottery no, no, even no, as a parody well because and here's the thing I'll, I'll give tidbits to to the audience about msl is uh one of msl's strengths that i like the most after seeing a number of cuts of the film are it's real down and dirty kind of look that you get into the nooks of the Boston area that every, that no other Boston movie has shown. So if you like that kind of atmosphere, uh, we've got a lot of it in here uh, that is seamless because we, we shot this guerrilla style. We were going out in the street. We were going into 
Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and not <laughs> we were shooting there. Uh, whereas the instigators is like this big budget spoof of all that. And it, it, it's it's just, I, I just don't believe a single frame of that. Whereas when we were shooting MSL, the moments that feel the realest and that feel the most tense and authentic in MSL are partly because of the way we shot in, in the performances and everything, but really just because we're just out there on cold ass nights in the winter shooting this for real. And yeah. and it just comes from the elements. Whereas the, the instigators is this big budget fabricated pile of pile of fooey, a bunch of phony baloney. I thought they were going to make references to old Spucky's pizza down the street from where we filmed. Oh, wow. MSL. Yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah. That's the kind of shameless, like, crap that was just in this two hour movie that was just uh just entirely like well i uh, listen i liked it i'll recommend the instigators but uh i uh, think listen i understand your point i i would agree with it and if i wasn't uh maybe so nostalgic for for quincy in boston i would be harsher towards it but i don't know i i'm I, nostalgic I a, for i'm nostalgic for the world that existed when we were actually there it's long gone that that you know that that was crazy for me i don't know the last time you went to quincy but i checked it out a couple of weeks ago and there's so much of it that is just totally redone in the shape of a lesser boston they tried to make it look like boston common essentially the businesses are either completely just corporate or they're chinese that's new and walking down the strip that I used to work on, I used to work for a dermatology clinic, um, and then up to my summer school where I had to attend for two years in a row because I was just like, I'm not showing up to class. I don't fucking care. I'll I'll just tough it out for six weeks at summer school. I don't care. It's so different now. It's wildly different. And even the, the center of Quincy, they were having some festival that was very crunchy Portland, Vermont, Bernie Sanders oh, was, type yeah, people. That, uh, yeah, with the, the the fat like blue haired chick that you, <laughs> that you put on blast on. Yeah, X. I kind of feel bad about that because you know standing next to John Adams. Yeah, just resting on her smartphone. But I don't understand what what compels these these girls, these big hogs of women, uh, to just walk around with their stomachs fully exposed. I mean, there used to be something called shame it used to be something called modesty like even if you thought oh wow someone there used to be something called sexy. bulimia that's what <laughs> yes, yes 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 yeah, these things that need that to out of fashion apparently how did that become uh lindy you know that's what i'm wondering <laughs> so uh anyway we gotta wrap up this show here because it's almost well, I, I was just time. really happy to be back so i wanted to kind of get into a few things and and make my presence known now that i've taken the crown back There's, yeah now yeah. now you're number one although you know, we've been doing so many shows with Mumkey Jones and Eggy that I feel like it's getting pretty, pretty high up. You, you and Jerry might have some competition now just because they arranged so many episodes with us based off these horrible YouTubers. You should have been on for the Channel Awesome films that we covered. That was really traumatizing to sit through those. That fucked me up. <laughs> um, there, there may be a time and place, but I, the, 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 the mental recovery needed... Uh, after watching Channel Awesome movies is, I, I don't know if at my old age now, I, I don't know if I have the fortitude for it. I might have to take drugs. Yeah. I'd have to get on some, some crazy pills. I didn't want to do that. That might be the best way to uh, tough it. I think white knuckling it is really a recipe for all sorts of spiraling, mental spiraling. So I'm glad to be done with those, although there might be like one or two lingering there. I think there's a Linkara film we're talking about. Oh, you really geez. get hard up for YouTuber movies. But uh, anyway, Jake, it's been a pretty big year for filmmaking for, for yourself and for myself. You want to talk about what, what is the plan with the shore? Are you going to be putting out? Um, I know you've got something lined up for October, right? That you're thinking about. And, um, you know, you're going to be working on a short film soon. What's, what's the situation? Yeah. So it's been, it's been pretty cool. We had a, we had a short film that we did <clears throat> back in the spring that premiered down here in Dallas at a, at a local festival. It did pretty well. I actually got a great response. Uh, you know, I have my own issues with it, of course. But it's, I, a, it's a, the best thing that you have shot to date, and it's visually terrific. And I think you should definitely uh, 
give it a give it a second run online because it's worth watching. I think you did a great job with it. Great. Well, we're we're looking at the possibilities of touring it around. I'm just scrapping up the funds to kind of see if I can get it into markets around Texas and then branch out and give it just give it a road show of some sort because there is a feature idea that I have ready to go with that film and it, with the resources that we have already like the location it, it would make a fantastic feature so that's something I've, I've got in the back pocket uh yeah and this next one I'm gonna get to work on really soon I think uh actually by Monday I'll probably have a script locked but it's another kind of organized festival going on in town here and the theme is 80s horror and what I want to do is um well w without saying exactly what yet is man well i just want to make something really fun and uh making the short i did last year for halloween was one of the most fun times i had had shooting something in a while because we came off of uh, msl after a few legs of the shoot and then i was really busy working on other people's movies for for a number of years which was great getting the experience but it made me miss just running out when I had the time and shooting, uh, shooting some, you know, some of my own stuff. So we did that last year and it was great. I mean, it was a crazy amount of work. We shot it in four hours and uh, it turned out to be about 10 and a half minutes. And it was a 48 hour film from the second we started rolling cameras to when I put it out, because I knew I needed that, it out on Halloween. We shot it on the 29th and I dropped it on Halloween day. So we're going to have something else, for this year, luckily we'll have more time. I've got about six, seven weeks to make it and then submit it. And then hopefully we get uh, some recognition at this local festival again. I know the organizers were really happy to get me back involved. I, they, they really seem to like the last one. So. And then just the general kind of community down here in the neighborhood has really r rallied around the energy to make another. And I have, I have a couple ideas that I want to put into one short. It'll be a bit ambitious, I think, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's what's uh, that's what's coming up next. And I, you know, hopefully by Monday I've got the script locked because we're going to shoot it intermittently for the next probably five weeks. Yeah, I mean that's all terrific. I mean I, I I'm really happy seeing you back to work in the director's chair because of that interim period where you were working on big budget movies, real like serious uh, organized SAG productions and what have you. And now it's it's time to get back in the driver's seat and start coming up with stories and, you know, putting the pedal to the metal. Well, there, yeah, there's no turning back now. As far as I'm concerned, this is this is the only way forward. And to to plug even more like the release of MSL, there's been a lot of talks behind the scenes on that that have been really excited about. And I mean, yeah, it's just no turning back now. So anything I can do to keep creating or to keep mobilizing what we're doing, that's that's that, that, that's the only move. It's no, paramount. That's, it's the only chess chess move. And we might both have movies that we're going to be directing in November. I don't know. We shouldn't speak about that for the time being because you never want to like jinx what could be happening. What could happen? We'll see. I think November is starting to build all this energy around it to be an important time, a weirdly momentous month for this year uh, so yeah election election season and then possible big projects in the fold that elections two projects hans flying to america what else thanksgiving i don't know there's a there's a lot that could be happening in november and it i think it's gonna be a very exciting time so long as all the right pieces fall into place which right now it doesn't look like that's gonna be difficult to accomplish so let's keep our fingers crossed that it's a good important month and not a chaotic negative month i think it's going to be good though i think i have a sense it's going to be good don't quote oh, me yeah. on that i, I, I did now listen great. my my senses have told me before joker 2 is going to be a musical which is oddly specific but if I'm wrong here, don't hold it against me. Anyway, uh, you can follow Jake on X at the Tologist. And what is your, you want to plug your letterbox or you want, what else? Yeah, yeah, I've been out? trying to be more active on that because I hate all the Zoomers that are on it. So if, if for nothing else, 
follow me on there despite them yeah just it's um just cinematologist on letterboxd i try to i i hate to be that dude that's like the second i see a movie i review it and go on there but i i, I want to add some balance to the what i what i think has been a, a, pl a place that was started with good intentions but has since become a meme of itself the culture so. that it spawned i think is really gross and not something i'm a fan of and i try not to contribute to that although you know i i'm definitely guilty of writing humorous reviews on there i think well, I sincerity think is to, underrated but people I think you don't need to have some sincerity but you need to have I, I think that's the way people latch onto it if you have a take that's subversive but you you, you paint it in something that somebody can stop and chuckle at i unfortunately i think that's the game you need because i started out on there writing very serious takes on what i thought of movies and um it's not i don't think it, yeah i think no you're you're right about that it's because it is built for that it becomes not the spot for it because enough people will do that and no one's really visiting it for that reason they want little quippy reviews that are gonna go <laughs> that's that's funny that's true i guess and that's how you get followers on there I would know because I have 606 followers on Letterboxd. That's pretty good. I, I, I think I have a solid like 70. <laughs> the 70 is not bad. Listen, I've seen people on there who have like 30,000. I don't know how the hell they managed to do that, but that's rare. The idea of a high follower count on Letterboxd is much more modest than what I have. You I have 88. Wow. That's a bit more than I thought. <laughs> there you go. 88. Very important double digit number there. How about that? All right. Well, uh, on that note, anyway, Trap, I think we talked about it very well for a full hour. You know exactly what you're in for if you listen to this episode and you haven't watched Trap yet. Uh, maybe we got to go back to M. Night. Maybe we got to check out, I think there could be potential in doing Split and Glass as a double feature. Because I, have I've, I haven't watched Glass and I haven't watched Knock at the Cabin. I haven't watched the last airbender or after there's still like a, enough in the m night oeuvre that is a blind spot for me that i haven't covered praying with anger wide awake actually you know what we were supposed to do wide awake the rosie o'donnell movie oh, and yeah. i had it downloaded it took forever to download and then we didn't wind up doing it and that was the end of the m night series until now so leave it to rosie o'donnell that fat pig she, she de derails everything everything I did watch her talk show when I was a boy, though. I will. Her best performance that. is in Tarzan as the voice of the little boy ape. Boy ape. I want to name my <laughs> son. Name. That. Uh, she's she. You know what she's good in? She's good in. I know this much is true, which was an HBO limited series with Mark Ruffalo, who I also typically cannot stand, but for real life reasons, not for his acting. He's usually pretty okay as an actor. I can't stand him because he's five foot four. That's that's one of the he looks like he stinks. I think that's the biggest thing for me. He looks like he smells like a like a men's locker room. I think it yeah, that well that's just called being Italian, actually. Whoa. Okay. We don't need Mediterranean prejudice coming out in the eleventh hour of this podcast. But uh all right, we'll 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 have you back on very soon. Maybe we'll do a year end wrap up if you continue doing these triple features of movies like reagan and dd on your trips to the amc yeah yeah absolutely i i mean it's just good to be going back to the movies this much and like again if you can latch on to one of these kinds of memberships like whether you do regal or amc or showcase cinemas if they still have those they used to have that back home wow um, wow yeah. showcases actually you know what they do have a showcase i went to go see alien romulus at, a, at the one showcase cinemas that I know we still up and at them. I have, well, I, is Alamo that just a Massachusetts brand? Texans. It might be, but uh, then Alamo Draft House came back because it was bought up by uh, Sony. So that could be. Yeah. Thing. Alamo, but, I might wind up doing because I, I, I've made an effort kind of like you to be like, okay, this year I'm going to try and see as many films in the theater if I have the option as possible. I'm going to get my patronage to movies as frequently as I can, because it does make a difference. I went to go see a seven and a half hour Hitler movie at, um, in, uh, oh God, where did it play? Fuck, where did it play? I forget where it played. But the experience of watching that rare film, which hadn't been screened in something like 40 years, over 
two nights going in, okay, three and a half hours this night, three and a half hours this night. It made a significant difference in the viewing experience because I tried to watch it. It was called Our Hitler, a film from Germany. Francis Ford Coppola technically produced it, but retroactively he released it in America. He gave it a venue. And it's a very interesting film that is not like any movie I've ever seen before. And I tried to watch it on my iMac here and bringing it up on the TV and I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't sit and give my full attention to it. And having to be stuck in the theater and watching it and being so bored for hours of it, you still retain a lot and you take away a lot even when you're bored. To be bored is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not the first person to say that, but it's true especially for a movie of that length, you're going to want to take a nap at some point. You might want to walk out of the theater. Some guy actually cracked open a beer 20 minutes into the first part of the movie and fell asleep and started snoring. So that was the experience of our Hitler, a film from Germany, but it was a great, great picture. Uh, anyway, all that to say, that's also why I saw Reagan a couple of days ago. It's like, when, when am I going to have this experience? I'm going to hate it extra if I watch it as an illegal download on my computer, I might as well go sit in the theater and just f take that feeling in. Let me see what this feels like to watch this movie in a theater. And as bad as the movie was, it's still, it's fine. It's a fine time. It wasn't yeah, I just, just, I think we should go out and see as many movies as we can. And these kind of memberships, if you can do them, or if you can just afford to do the 20 bucks of a week to see a few movies or whatever, uh, see him because I, I don't I don't think we need to we need to keep that from being antiquated. I think a lot of a lot of people right now wouldn't mind that, and that's the problem. So let's keep going to the movies from being antiquated. That's that's my big PSA today. That's a good closing line, but unfortunately, <laughs> I always have the closing line, and that has been movies for this week. Thank you for listening.